assignment to them, and then he fills them and qualifies them to fulfill their assignment. I don't know about you, but every last one of you, under the sound of my voice, God created you with a purpose. You all have a purpose, my God. That means God has a plan for that purpose. And that purpose is to advance God's kingdom. That purpose is to make a difference down here on earth. So if you do not know what your purpose is, I want to encourage you to begin to ask God, what is my purpose? Why did you create him? Create me. What am I called to do? How am I supposed to advance your kingdom? You should know that. Trust me. There's people in here right now, my God, that don't know what their purpose is and they lived half their life. There's people in here right now that don't know what their purpose is and they lived over half of their life. When you begin to discover what your purpose is and you begin to find purpose, you don't live. I mean, you don't exist. You live. Life takes on a different perspective. Life takes on a different meaning. You begin to place the right people in your life. My God, you remove the wrong people out of your space and you bring the right people to your space to help you fulfill that what God has created and called you to do. Do I got a witness out there? Come on, y'all got to talk to me because they're going off for Christ. We talk. Come on, somebody. Yes, Lord. But I want to encourage you, my God, to begin to ask God to reveal your purpose, especially to the, the young, young men and young women off in there. Your, one of your prayers should be, one of your pleas should be, God, what is my purpose? Why did you create me? Why did I make it out? Come on, somebody. Why am I still here today? And if you are older, my God, which is most of the congregation is, you still, God still requires some things of you. God still requires some things of you. My God, life is not over. My God, the Bible also tells us the older should teach the younger. The older men should teach the younger men. The older women should teach the, come on, the younger women. Come on, somebody. So God has need for every last one of us in the house of the Lord on the day. And if you ever wonder what God wants from you, this scripture, my God, in the book of Micah, my God, tells us clearly what the Lord wants for us to do, what the Lord wants us to do and who he wants to be in our life. My God, oh my God, let's look at these verses and find the answer to the question. So the title of my sermon is, what does the Lord want from me? Write that down, please. What does the Lord want from me? Not from Pastor Richie, not from a Pastor Nita, not from Pastor Peoples, but what does the Lord want from me? God has something special, my God, for you and I to do on this earth. But before, my God, in context to the scripture, he had a complaint against the people. So point number one, the Lord's prosecution. He had some accusations that he brought against the nation, my God. And we're going to bring that from the Old Testament and make it revelatory to who we are and what we are called to do today. So this passage opens with God himself serving in the role of a prosecuting attorney. In verses one and two, God calls on creation to witness his case against his people, Israel. In verse 2, God says the Lord had the controversy with his people. The word controversy refers to a dispute, a quarrel, a case at law. God has judged Israel to be guilty of sin against himself. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. And God is going to lay out his case against them. In verse 2, the Lord says he will plead with Israel. The word plead means to argue. It means God is about to lay out his reasons for taking Israel to court. According to verse 3, God makes his plea to his people. He asks two important questions, which reveal his frustration with Israel. Now, I'm going to pause right there, my God, because I'm more of a teacher. I'm not a hoop and holler type person. But, my God, we're talking about an Old Testament time, my God, but I'm going to bring it up to our time. When you look at society today, if you be truthful, my God, and you evaluate the state of Christianity today, you can all agree with me, for those that are living in truth and not deceived, my God, that Christianity is not being effective at the level that God ordained it to be. Do I got a witness out there? So I believe that God has a case against Christianity today. My God, are you listening to me? Because there's things that God has asked us to do that we're not doing. My God, it seems like evil is prevailing even much more, even though the Bible says that in the last days that uh, evil will increase, my God, and ungodly and we're increasing at the same time. But what I'm finding out, because I travel a lot, I speak a lot, and I deal with a lot of people, there are so many Christians leaving the household of faith. There are so many Christians shipwrecking. There are so many Christians turning away from the things of God. They are discouraged. Amen. That's why I said the body of Christ are hurting. And I must be honest, a lot of what you're hearing in the pulpits and a lot of what the pastors and leaders and preachers are doing is causing a lot of pain to the people that are sitting in the church right out there. Are you listening to me? And so God has a case, not only against Israel, he has a case, especially against American Christianity. I told y'all we're not going to talk about prophecy today, we're going to talk about some truth right here today. Are you with me so far? And so God has a, and so the word please, please, my God, God, God has frustrated Israel. God asked, what have I done to thee? 
And wherein have I wearied thee? He wants to know how he has offended them. What he has done to cause them to walk in rebellion against him. What he has done to make his people turn against him. In verse 4, I'm just going to break these scriptures down, then we're going to get going. In verse 4, God reminds Israel how good he has been to them. The songs testify God is so, so good to us. Have God been good to anybody other than Pastor Peoples in her? God is so, so good to us. My God, and God reminds them in verse 4, oh my God, how good he's been to them. He reminds them of how he redeemed them and delivered them from Egypt. Oh, my God, he reminds them of the leaders he gave them, that they did their best to show the people the right path to walk. My God, in verse 5, God reminds them of how he protected them as they wandered through the wilderness. He reminds them of how he used the evil prophet Balaam to bless them, even though Balak, Balak hired Balaam to curse him. I have something that I like to say, and I always do at my church, my God. But one thing about me, I, I'm not a, I, I just love God. And so, therefore, I know that when God blesses you, when God do things for you, it should increase your tenacity. It should increase your pursuit for the things of God. When we sing the songs, my God, that God is so good, my God, that's more than just words, my God. When you look at your life and all the things God has done for you, my God, oh, my God, I don't know about you, but my testimony is real, real, my God. And when you think about all the things God has brought you through, all the things that God has helped you overcome, all the things that he kept you from that you didn't know nothing about. So when you talk about and sing songs that God is good, it ought to make your love, my God. It ought to make you increase your love and your pursuit for the things of God. Oh, my God, it ought to make you just fall more and more in love with God because he's been so, so good, my God. But sometimes I found, especially in Christendom, that when God blesses a person, they back up on God. When God get a person out of a hard place, they slow down on God. I thank you for the witnesses over here. My God, some of us, my God, God has done some things for us, my God, that we know it had not been nobody but God. But have your pursuit increased. Have your love increased. Have your commitment increased, my God, from the things that God has done for you. You sung the song and said he's so, so good. If he's so, so good, then, my God, it should push us to go harder. It should push us to love harder. It should push us to be more of a witness. It should push us to, more, to die more to ourselves. It should push us to be conformed to his image and his likeness. Come on, somebody. If God has been good to you, my God, you ought to be good to him. There's nothing wrong with God asking for you to be good to him when he has been good to you. Come on, somebody. And so he closes with verse 5. He says, by pleading with Israel to repent so they might know the righteousness of the Lord. Oh, it's going to get good. The word righteousness refers to doing what is right and to act according to God's standard. Doing what is right and to act according to God's standard. So I was looking at a conference. Oh, my God, the Mantle Conference in Atlanta. And uh, Prophet Juanita Byman said, people are not leaving the church. They're leaving the circus that goes on in church. So, 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 so they, oh, come on now, they're not just necessarily leaving the church, but they're leaving the circus. Because, my God, we make no room for God to move. Everything is scripted. Come on. Everything is legal. Everything is legalistic and so religious. They rush the people in. Get them out. Don't keep them too long because they'll get mad. But they can go to the movies, to the football game, to the church and stuff, and they stay four or five hours and never complain. You only complain when you get to the house of the Lord, my God. And people are tired of the circus, my God. And then you got people, my God, that don't they, they come to the house of the Lord, my God. And they don't want you to disrupt their lives. They don't want you to ask them to repent. They don't want you to ask them to love. They don't want you to ask them to forgive, my God. There's so much going on in the American church today, my God, that I know, my God, by the Spirit of God, that God is not pleased with. We are, we are made to be too comfortable in the church. We don't want to be provoked. We don't want to be challenged. My God, don't ask me to do something I don't feel like doing. Don't ask me to come down on a Tuesday night. Don't ask me to stay at the church and vacuum and sweep and clean the bathroom. Don't ask me to forgive. Don't ask me to stop lusting. Don't ask me to stop looking at pornography, my God. Now you all in my business. Now I'm offended at the pastor because he's holding me the truth. Somebody give God a hand in the church. Come on, somebody. I know you don't like it. It's the truth, but it's tight, but it's right. And so God had an issue, my God, with the nation. Come on, my God. And God has an issue with the American church today. I'm going to pick you up, but I got to lay this foundation. So the word righteousness is doing what is right, acting according to God's standard. Ultimately, this is what God is doing. God is calling his people, not Israel, church, Harvest Church, going off of Christ, and us today. He's calling us to abandon our sins, to repent of evil, oh my God, and to remember, we sung it, his goodness. Abandon our sins to repent of evil, my God, by evil ways, and to remember the goodness of the Lord and to return to him. Oh, my God, I must say this, my God, just because we sit in the church don't mean we in Christ. You got a lot of people that go to church every Sunday, but they're not in Christ. 
Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. You translate that word to in Christ. He said, I can do all things through Christ. There are certain things that you can't overcome outside of Christ. This is why you got to be in Christ. And just coming to church don't mean you in Christ. Reading your devotion every now and then don't mean you in Christ. Paying your tithes every now and then don't mean you in Christ. Being in Christ is like John 15. I is the vine and we are the branch. Oh, my God, that's relationship. Come on, somebody. He said, as long as you abide in me, I abide in you. You get in me, I get in you, my God, and we can do some things together. Come on, somebody. So I want to encourage you, my God. Just coming to church is not enough. Come on. Just giving your tithes is not enough, baby. You got to have a hunger and a desire. Blessed is the man who hunger and thirst after righteousness, my God. You got to have a hunger, my God, for the things of God. You got to have a pursuit for the things of God. And when Christ gets in you, the things that you think can't change will change. The habits and hang that you can't break will break when you get in Christ. Who am I talking to in the church? But you got to get in Christ. And when you get in Christ, there'll be some fire about you. When it be in, you get in Christ, there'll be something different about you. When you get in Christ, you'll have a different... <laughs> You have a different aroma about yourself. Who am I talking to? You attract people, my God, when you're in Christ. But when you're in church, my God, that don't attract. But when you're in Christ, that's something different. Oh, my God, you talk different, walk different, smell different, dress different. Come on, somebody, when you're in Christ. And a lot of the people are sitting in churches, but they're not in Christ who died for the church. And so, my God, we want, we want to make God out to Santa Claus. We want God to give us everything, but we want to do very little for him. We want everything from God. Even our prayers is selfish. We come down and we pray, and everything's about fix my marriage, save my children, give me some money, give me a job, heal me, my God. But you got to get to the point, my God, where you get past your bringing your needs to God, where you learn how to bring other people's needs to God. See, we can even be selfish even when it comes to our prayer life. Are you listening to me? And see, we got to watch that. See what I say? Your Christianity, my God, is not just about you. After God deliver you, now it's time for you to go help somebody else get delivered. When God set you free, now it's time for you to help somebody else get free. I teach my church, your testimony don't belong to you. When God delivered you from something, now you got to go back and testify and tell somebody what he done for you. That's why he said they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Don't be ashamed to testify about what God brought you out of. Don't be afraid to give God no glory. Somebody needs your testimony. If you was a drug addict, testify that you no longer a drug addict. If you was a prostitute, testify that you're no longer a prostitute. If you're dealing with depression, testify that God didn't deliver you from depression. So somebody needs your testimony. Quit being ashamed to tell somebody what you've been through. Because some of us are going through stuff so God can get the glory. The Bible says everything God does, he wants the glory. So God allows you to be going through things so when he brings you out of it, you can tell somebody that it wasn't nobody but Jehovah that brought me out of it. It wasn't nobody but Christ that brought me out of this. God will put you in situation and everybody look at you like, man, he ain't going to be done. Man, she ain't going to be done. And they look up six months later or three years later and now you're sitting on top of the mountain. Come on, somebody, because God did it. Sometimes God will let you suffer in front of people before he raised you up. Sometimes God will make things get so bad before he turn it around for good. So when people begin to watch, my God, they know that it wasn't nobody but Christ that did it because everything he does, he wants the glory. So don't be afraid of your testimony. Don't be afraid to share what God has brought you out of. Somebody give God a hand in the church house today. My God. Mm. And so God is calling, my God, the nation context as well as here at Harvest Church and at going over Christ and in America. He's calling us to abandon to repent and to remember the goodness of the Lord. Oh, my God. God seems amazed that his people would treat him so badly after all he has done for them. God makes his case against Israel. He calls them back to himself. He's still making that same clarion call today. 2,000 some years ago, God is still calling the people of God back to him. He's still asking us to abandon our will. He's still calling us, asking us, my God, to abandon our way. He's still asking us, my God, to love him the way he loved us. He's still asking us to forgive the way he forgave. Come on, that's why he said when you're at the altar and you're praying and you realize you have art or offense against someone, leave your gift, my God, at the altar and go back and be restored with your brother or your sister and then come back and offer your gift. God says, my God, come on, somebody, you want me to forgive you, but you won't forgive. You got to abandon that hard heart. You got to abandon that type of ways, my God. The same thing they was doing back then, we still doing it today in the body of Christ. I know it's tight, but it's right. They were rebelling against him, yet he still calls them his people. We said he's such a loving God. He loves us so much. God is so long-suffering. He loves them in spite of their failures. He loves them in spite of their stubborn rebellion against him. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are like the ancient Israel. The Lord has been good to us. Oh, my God, he saved us. He's changed us. He met our needs. He's answered our prayers, and he's blessed us in amazing ways. But we still tend to wander away from him. 
am I do? I got a witness out there. Sometimes we refuse to obey him even in the simplest commands. We take God for granted. We neglect worship. We stay away from his house when it's time for to worship. We stay away from his house when it is time to worship because we have other things to do. I like to pause right there. Really what that comes down to, my God, we got too many God, little gods interfering with the throne. Anything that's competing for the, and you got to understand, as long as you got breath in your body, you're going to have little G's, little things competing for the throne room of your life. But on the throne, it should be nobody but God. And my God, and when you got all these bout, all these little gods competing and sitting on the throne of your mind and your affections, my God, you're going to always be double-minded and torn between two opinions when you got two gods, my God, fighting for the throne. And you got to realize in a kingdom, my God, it can only be one king. And I promise you, my God, our Lord and Savior will not bow down to our little G's. He's God and he's God all by himself. Are you listening to me? So you have to welcome him into your life. You got to give the king permission to do business in your life. Come on, somebody. He's not going to compete, my God. At the end of the day, my God, God is God and he's God all by himself. Do I got a witness? So stop and think about that. What little G's is in my life? What little things, my God, that's interfering with God being supreme in my life? We got to stop and think. See, it's good to come to church, my God, and leave up out of church, my God, thinking, okay, how can I be better? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? See, it's not healthy when you can come to church, my God, and you never confront, my God, the God who died for the church. You come in one way, and you go out the same way you came in. That's not good. Because anytime you meet with God, and the presence of God is in the building, or the presence of God is in the place, there's no way you can meet a holy God and stay the same. There's no way you can meet a holy God and stay angry, and stay bitter, and stay hateful, and stay, come on somebody, oh my, something got to change, every habit got to break off, strongholds have to be broken, come on somebody, you can't have a head on collision, ask Paul before he became Saul, before he became Paul, you can't meet a holy God and stay the same. So you got to ask yourself, when you come into the house of the Lord, are you coming with an expectation to meet God? Are you just coming to check it off, baby? Because when you meet God, my God, I promise you, your problems, your hangups, your habits, your pain, your brokenness, my God, will get healed in the presence of the Lord. You will get set free in the presence of the Lord. I know it, just the truth. Come on, somebody, give God a hand in the church. My God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. But God said, come on now, y'all come on back to me. Remember, I saved you. I changed you. My God, we allow anger and unforgiveness or a lack of genuine love to hinder our walk with God. See, if you can locate yourself, let me say it again, we allow anger, unforgiveness, and a lack of genuine love for others to hinder our walk with the Lord. We tolerate sin in our lives. We refuse to abandon sin. And my God, and we need to repent. We place our will ahead of God's will. We do this, my God, we do this as we please instead of doing what God tells us to do. We got to be very careful, my God, that we are submitted to the will of God. And the Bible says, my God, the Lord requires some things of us. He requires some of those things that I just listed. He requires that our will become his will. He requires that we submit and we surrender. But some of us may say, it don't take all that. Some of us may say, do I really have to do all that? Do I have to fast and pray? Do I have to forgive? Do I have to love? Do I have to love the unlovable? Do I have to forgive my ex-husband who left me? Do I have to forgive my mama who abandoned me? Do I have to forgive my father who abandoned me? Do I have to forgive the man that molested me? Yeah. You got to come face to face with that. Because trust me, in the midst of all the people that's here, there's still a lot of trauma in our hearts. There's still a lot of pain in our hearts. There's still a lot of undealt with issues in our heart. And I'm just a teacher that'll talk about it. I'm not afraid to talk about it. Because there's a lot of people sitting in churches around the nation that's not dealing with the real problem. See, they're trying to say they're hearing good preaching, but they're not getting transformed. Because they don't want to come face to face with their real issues. This right here, this word is bringing us face to face to making us think. My God, is it my will or is it his will? Do I really love or do I love the people I want to love? Are you listening to me? Do I still got hate in my heart? Do I got prejudice in my heart? And I'm not just saying it because this is predominantly Caucasian church because I say the same thing in my church. See, they're trying to say, don't tell me you love God, but you prejudice. Don't tell me you love God, but you hate. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. What does the Lord require me? Love. He didn't say, what does the Lord require me? Hate. He said, what does the Lord require me? He says, love. Come on, somebody. Yes, you know, it says forgive. It says his will. Oh, my God. And the list of grievances can go on and on. Elijah asked Israel, my God, how long will you be torn between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If by all, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah asked the people, if you're going to follow God, follow God. The Bible says, I set before you life and death. Blessed and the curses, choose life. 
Now, we are Christians, and we should be choosing life. But majority of the time, after we get out of church at 12 o'clock or whatever time you get out, my God, what type of decisions are you choosing? Because if he's Lord of your life and he's head of your life, then our thoughts and our choices, my God, should be submitted to his will. And so if we're making choices and, and, and having thoughts that's unacceptable, my God, then we got to ask God to go up into the attic of our mind and renovate our mind. Some of our biggest battles is in our mind. That's why Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Come on, somebody, you can't cross over, my God, and your mind can't be renewed. Your mind can't be renovated if you're not reading the word. It's not enough, my God, to listen to somebody else preach. It's not enough to just ride down the street and listen to somebody. You got to open up that Bible. You got to sit with God and you got to allow God to renovate, renovate. Think about my verb is renovate. When you go up into an attic of a house, my God, you put stuff up in the attic. You got to say, God, go up into the attic of my mind and bring down that pain, bring down that trauma. Help me deal with this stuff. We need our minds renovated. See what I'm trying to say? Because you can't fully follow God, my God, with an unrepentant mind. The Bible says it's with the mind that you will not serve God. So if our mind is messed up, guess what our life going to be? You could be in church talking about hallelujah, thank you, Lord, speaking in tongues, your mind be completely away from God. It's with the mind that you serve God. That's why Paul said be transformed. You can go from a caterpillar to a butterfly. God can do so much in your mind, my God. When you speak about your testimony, you can be like, man, woman of God used to be like that. Man, man of God used to do all that. Yeah, I did. I should do all that. But you can't tell it because I've been transformed. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be transformed. But Elijah said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. And this is the same word that God is saying to us right now in Harvest Church. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. If you're going to serve God, be with God. If you're going to sell, serve Baal, be with Baal. Uh, some people say, call it Baal, but uh, Baal, uh, Baal, choose this day whom you're going to serve. We got to make a decision today, church. My God, because one thing that, that, that will cause us uh, internal pain is when our will is fighting and clashing against God's will for our life. One thing that will cause us inner pain is when our will, we want what we want when we want it. It's what I tell my church. My God begin to clash against what God wants. And trust me, you and I will never win, my God, when it comes to us fighting against God. Oh, I know you're thinking, so I ain't going to worry about the amens. <laughs> so Elijah asked Israel, how long have you been halted between two opinions? The word halt means to limp, to become crippled. They were stumbling through life, trying to hold on. To God with one hand while they held by all by the other. It isn't what we do. We need to decide who or what we love. Oh, my God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Oh, my God. Yes, Lord. We need to make up our minds to either go after God or to go after the world. But we can't have them both. God has a valid case, church, my God, against us. My God, not them, us. Just as he had a valid case against Israel. We are guilty and often we have tough times seeing our true condition. That's why we can't listen to and sit up on the watered down words because it will never show you your true condition. You could think there's a way that seems right to a man that leads to destruction. You could sit, my God, and think that you're in a good place, man, you truthfully, you be not. Sometimes we get to the point that we sitting up on the weak words, weak watered down words. My God, we'll think we're at a good place and truth be told, we're not at a good place when it talks about our soul, when it talks about in relation to God. You got to ask yourself for those who know what their purpose is, for those, my God, who know what they are called to do. You got to ask yourself, am I fulfilling God's purpose for my life? If I'm not fulfilling God's purpose for my life, then you got to ask yourself, are you doing yourself and God a disservice as a kingdom subject in his kingdom? Because the Bible, of course, is about a king and his kingdom. We are subjects in God's kingdom. And so, therefore, we are heaven's representatives on earth. So, that's why the Bible calls us representatives and ambassadors. So, you and I are supposed to represent the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to let heaven work through us. Are you listening to me? And so, if you're not functioning in what God has called you to do, my God, if you ain't passionate about the things of God, if you are, ooh, my, come on, somebody, if we are, 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 are lukewarm, come on, somebody, if we are ashamed to testify about the goodness of God, then we're not doing God a service. Everywhere you go into the marketplaces, at your job, at the nail shop, at the barber shop, wherever you go, my God, that's an opportunity, my God, when God presented for you to be able to share your, 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 the goodness of the Lord. Don't be afraid to testify about Jesus. Many people say, I want to give honor to the, the, the man above. Many people say, I want to give God honor to the, the man upstairs. No, my God, I'm giving honor to Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Who am I talking to in the church? Come on, somebody. Because guess what? Why do I say that? Because when you say I give honor to God, a God could be anything. 
Just like they had many gods in the Old Testament. Now clarify who your God is. Don't be afraid to testify and say, I believe in Jesus, the Christ. My God, I give Jesus the glory. I give Jesus the honor. My God, come on somebody. He said, if you confess me before man, I confess you before my father. If you deny me before man, I deny you before my father. And there's a lot of people in Christianity, Christianity today denying Christ. Won't say nothing about Christ. You'll never even know they're a Christian. Even the friends you've been hanging out with for years, my God, they know you go to church, but you ain't never told them you was a Christian. That's not good. God has an accusation against that right there. Are y'all with me so far? I'm just trying to spark us, my God, to make a difference here on earth, my God, on our way to heaven. See, I'm trying to say, yes, we deal with the prophetic. Yes, I believe in the prophetic. But at the end of the day, God has called me to make a difference. God has called me to represent. God has told, called me to execute. God has called me to use my hands, my mouth, my feet for the advancement of the kingdom. I have a purpose, my God. And it's to make sure that I try to lead and help as many people, my God, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have work to do. And the church is way behind and the church is losing. Because we preaching these, these, these comfortable messages, make us stay comfortable in our church and never afraid to provoke people to be better, provoke people and challenge people. People, my God, to move to a higher level because we worried about if we tell the truth and we provoke them, they're going to leave. You got a lot of pastors. I tell Pastor Richie this all the time. You got a lot of pastors that's walking in the pool pit, son, that's in fear. They in fear, standing up here, fearful, fearful to say what the Holy Ghost would tell them to say because they're too worried about who's going to leave and who's going to get offended and stuff like that. Well, this ain't that pastor. That man out here, my God, I'm going to preach the truth, baby. You better ask somebody. Yes, Lord, because for, mm, hey, for some people, I get one shot with you. The late Dr. Miles were talk, Mark, Miles were old talking, you get one shot with people, and I got to seize the moment. My spiritual father, Bishop Gary McIntosh, told me whenever you stand before the people of God, you seize the moment, because you never, you might not get another one. I'm not standing up here fearful. I'm going to preach the gospel, and if God says challenge, I'm going to challenge. If God said provoke, I'm going to provoke. I remember the last time I was here, a couple of times I heard one lady came up to me and said, yeah, I, I, I got mad at you. And I'm looking at her right now, but I won't call that. She said, I got mad at you. And I was like, what's going on? Happen? You know what I said? Because what you were telling me was the truth. And she's sitting here right now. What you were telling me was the truth, and I didn't want to accept the truth. But it's the truth. You can't be afraid to tell the truth. You can't be afraid to pull people higher. You can't let people stay in the mediocre when God called us to, have, to dominion. Don't you know God gave us dominion, rulership? You are supposed to rule, my God. You should, drugs shouldn't be ruling you. Pornography shouldn't be ruling you. Pride shouldn't be ruling you. And I, that stuff supposed to be up on our feet. Who am I talking to in the church? And the church got to come up, my God. We got to have a different aroma. We got to march to a different beat, baby. We can't let the culture dictate what's going on in the church. That's what's wrong with a lot of pastors. They conform to the culture instead of making the culture conform to Christ. Who am I talking to in the church? church baby Woo, somebody give God a hand in the church baby mm. I'm almost through let's go to point two let's look at what the people had to say they had a plea they had a plea Israel hears the message of God and responds with sarcasm some people read these verses my God and see in Israel a willingness to repent a willingness to pay any price to be right with God in verse six they said what is it going to take to work this out God will burnt offerings be enough or should we sacrifice thousands of rams? Should we offer 10,000 rivers of oil? Should we give up our firstborn children? Should we offer the fruit of our bodies, God, for the sins we have committed? What is it going to take to make you happy, God? Trust me, you got people sitting in these churches all around the nation having conversations with God like that. Okay, God, I come to church. What else you want me to do? I read my Bible sometime. And I, I, God, God, you mean Tim, I got to stop that? You mean Tim, I got to give up that? You mean, Tim, I got to forgive the man that abandoned me? You mean, Tim, I got to forgive the husband that abused me? You gotta, I got to forgive the man that molested me? I got to forgive the boss that mistreated me? I got to forgive the mama that told me I wasn't going to be nothing? I got to forgive the kids, my God, that don't respect me? Yeah. What does the Lord require? Yeah. We got to do all those things. I got to submit? I got to surrender? Yeah. We got to do that. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Mm. They thought they could buy God off too, by the way. They believe he would be satisfied with the works of their hands. That's why they begin to try to offer, in verse 6, all these different things, outward religion, without an inward commitment. That's where the church is, outward religion, religiosity, but no inward commitment. Church is in a bad state, but God going to win. God going to win. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Mm. 
The ancient sacrifices, my God, demanded under the law were not given to Israel so they could satisfy God. The sacrifices, let me give you some meat. The sacrifice were given as means for God to a minister of grace, forgiveness, and repentance, my God, for sinners. The ancient sacrifices were a shadow of a better sacrifice to come later, my God. A sacrifice which would take away the sins forever. The sacrifices pointed ahead that they were trying to offer to Jesus Christ, who would give his life on the cross as a ransom for sin. Many people, please, if this is your attitude, we got to repent today. Have the same attitude towards God as we see in ancient Israel. I want to point out a re the real heart issue that, that Israel had. The real problem was they didn't consider themselves to be sinners. They didn't see themselves as being all that bad. But they were up, but they were, and so are we. Warren Wisby said, the only people God can save are lost people. The only people God can forgive are guilty people. We was once lost, and we was once guilty. And if you think you're not, then you are deceived. You might not live the lifestyle that I once lived, but that don't mean you better than me. You may have grew up in a penthouse, and somebody else may be on the slums. That don't mean you better than them. The late Dr. Miles Rowe taught me before he crossed over that when you see people walking around, some is mental illness that's homeless and stuff, that's just people who don't know their purpose. But they still somebody that Christ died for. That's why the Bible says, my God, we got to stay humble in our own eyes. When I first birthed going off of Christ Church 11 years ago, me and my wife, Pastor Larry, and my Caucasian pastor brother, my God, told me, he said, Pastor, people stay small in your own eyes. Got hundreds and hundreds of people in my church. Pastor Richie preaching to a full house right now. See, I'm trying to say, but I got to stay small in my own eyes. No matter how more far God take me, no matter what God do in my life, I got to stay small. No matter where you stay at, what your bank account like, what kind of car you drive, what neighborhood you stay in, stay small in your own eyes. That's what the Bible say. That ain't what Pastor people say. Yes, Lord. Mm. So they didn't see themselves as really that bad. Mm. Oh, God. The fact that Israel was guilty before God should have motivated them to repent of their shallow religion. I'm almost through. Humble themselves before God and seek him, but it didn't. They couldn't see how wicked they were. Sadly, neither can most people today. Which is the relation? What is the relationship with Jesus? Remember, salvation is not about what you can do. Salvation is about what he did. It's not about works. But the scripture, James, say, you say you got faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. So they go hand in hand. You can't tell me you got faith in God, but I see no works. Because true works will lead to faith. So that's why James said, you said you got faith? Well, you know, that's good. Show me by your works. But we're not talking about behavior modification. We're not talking about trying to work your way to salvation. But when you love God, my God, good deeds will follow. When you love God, my God, and you got faith in God, my God, you want to do the right thing. Are you listening to me? You want to be pleasing to people. You want to allow God to use you to help advance his kingdom. And my last point, the Lord's prescription. So you had the prosecutor attorney was God. That was point number one. The people's plea. They tried to justify their behavior because they didn't see themselves as guilty and wicked sinners. Come on, somebody. They thought they was better. Come on. You don't, don't tell me that spirit ain't rampant in the church of America. We don't see no need to repent. Come on, somebody. We don't see no need. My God, that's for somebody else. I didn't say that. I didn't do that. So that, that, that's them. My God, that's their story. See, then we start casting judgment. And then we start not, not casting judgment. I'm sorry. Then we start deflecting. But then this is the prescription to what does the law require of you and me. Micah's answer to the sarcastic words of Israel is straight to the point. He says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good. Micah says, you already know what God wants. If you would have taken the time to read his word, you would know what pleases the Lord. Israel's spiritual blindness has caused them to offer everything but the one thing God wanted most. What God wanted was a spiritual commitment from the heart. That will result in a changed life. I'm going to say that right there because I ain't got much left. That's what God is saying to you and to me today. The outward sacrifices, that's good. But if it's not going to lead you to a deeper commitment, that's not good. Showing up to church, 
Amen. Showing up to all the stuff through the week. Amen. But if the things that you are doing is not pushing you to a deeper commitment, then God is not pleased. See what I'm trying to say? That's just outward activity. Outward involvement. But the things that we are tending throughout the week, my God, should be dealing with our condition of our soul. It should be dealing with the, the mindset that we have. It should make us go deeper. It should make us go harder. Come on, somebody. It should make us commit more to the things of God. So I want you to think about what I'm saying. Because I didn't come to try to preach you happy. I come to drop something in your lap to make us think. Not you, not me, all of us. See, I'm trying to say, so therefore, all the things that you do, my God, quote, unquote, for Christ, is it increasing your commitment for God. See, because, see, this is, when, this is how easy and subtle the enemy is. We love our wives. I've been my wife 36 years. I'm, I've been my wife since I was 17. I'm 54. See, I'm trying to say, my wife, 36. Matter of fact, next month, if the Lord delays, coming to be 37 years. My God, and I love my wife, and I know you love your wife. But at the end of the day, they can't become before God. See what I'm trying to say? Well, the Bible tells us, my God, to delight in the Lord. I delight in my wife. I delight in making her feel good. I delight in doing things for her to make her smile. But at the end of the day, if we delight in making them happy, but we don't delight in making God happy, they become an idol. So God is not pleased with that. Some of us, my God, our families is our idol. Our children is our idol. Our profession is our idol. We got a lot of idols that needs to be dealt with today in the church. Right now. That's unpleasing to the Lord. What does the Lord require of me? God is requiring some things of you. God is requiring some things of the church. God is requiring some things of me. I don't know what God has asked you to do, but God may be telling you to let something go today. God may tell you to come down to the altar and say, God, increase my capacity to be more committed to you. God, my God, break the shame of me not being able to, me not willing to testify that I'm a Christian. And I'm not saying you got to run around talking about, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. When the opportunity presents itself, my God, how you conduct yourself, people will know because you will have a, an aroma about you. See what I'm trying to say? There should be something different, my God, about a kingdom believer than a worldly person. Are you listening to me? There should be some distinction. It got to be. The church looked too much like the world. We hear it all the time. But we part of the problem. We supposed to be affecting the world, but the world is affecting us. That's why I told Pastor Richie, I'm not going to never let the culture determine what's being preached that going on for Christ's church. I'm not going to never let the culture, my God, come in, my God, and when people come to the house of the Lord, it seems like it's a club. See what I'm trying to say? When people come into the house of the Lord, my God, looking at the way they dress, my God, you know what I'm saying? They say, older men got to close their eyes because the younger women is, come on, that's not going to happen. There's, you can't, come on, you can't bring that contamination into a holy environment. See, we, see, a lot of people will see, my God, here's another thing that hurts a lot of people at this day and time. My God, because they see structure, order, as control. But structure and order, when you look at the Constitution, my God, when Solomon set up, my God, Constitution means the Bible. When Solomon set up the temple, he, he designed it according to his father. He said, do it, as, build it according to the pattern. There are certain things that God requires. See what I'm trying to say? And so, therefore, when you see structure and order and stuff like that, people come into church, my God, they say, man, they too controlling over there. They almost like a cult. No, you're so used to dealing with chaos in society, and when you come to a place of order, you don't know how to adjust and adapt. This is why the church got to have a standard, and they got to keep it standard. Amen. So that people can adjust to the church culture instead of letting the culture, church adjust to the world's culture. Who am I, God, who am I talking to in the church? Somebody give God a hand in the church. Some of us don't like it because we're the ones that's kicking and playing it. We wanted to be too comfortable. We don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm, mm, mm. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Come on, y'all talk to me. Just don't say it. If it ain't helping you, just say, no, you ain't helping me. I'm mad at you. That's okay. <laughs> Let me give you this so we can get out of here. But like I stated, an inward commitment, a lot, of act, a lot of outward activity. Just because we have a lot of movement, I mean motion, just because we have a lot of motion in our life don't, let, don't mean we have a lot of movement. You get it? You get it? If you don't even want to get it, that's what I came for. 
And thank you for that because when you teach it, sometimes you need that confirmation, man of God, because I know this was going to provoke and challenge the people of God because we're so used to dealing with just prophecy. But this is a word, my God, that like I told you, that God was going to set right in our lap because God requires some things of the church today that the church is not doing. We're living beneath our kingly privileges. You're kings and queens, my God, but we act like slaves. Slave to the world, slave to the culture, slave to habits, slave to addictions, slave to anger, slave to trauma. We just defeated Christians. But we say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can't overcome nothing unless you're in Christ. I can't love my wife unless I love her through Christ. I can't forgive unless I forgive through Christ. Forgiveness is a choice. And when you understand, my God, that God forgave me and he said in order for me to be forgiven, then I have to forgive, that's not an option. See, we make Christianity about a democracy. We vote. The king's word, the king's word is supreme. It's final. I'm teaching y'all kingdom stuff. See, we approach God like a democracy with a democracy mindset. If we like it, we vote for it. If we don't like it, we shoot it down. See what I'm trying to say? And that's not how it works, my God. You don't get to argue with the king's decrees. He made the decrees, and it's final. What Genesis through Revelation say, that's what it is. Not what culture say, not what the pastor say, what do the books say. This is the same stuff I teach in my church. I ain't telling y'all nothing different. Don't tell mine. You don't get to argue with the king. This right here is about a king and his kingdom, and what he say is final. You and I don't have a vote. You and I don't get to vote Democracy or Republican. I mean, Democrat, Republican. This ain't about that right there, baby. That the king has decreed it. He has said it. In his, and his word is supreme. Yeah. In the Old Testament, anytime you uh, went against the king, they brought you before the king and killed you. Thank God for his grace and mercy today. Yeah. Thank God that he's not handling us like he did in the Old Testament time. But that's the problem in the church because we vote. We pick and choose what we're going to submit to concerning the king and his kingdom. Are you listening to me? And God is not pleased with that. And nobody's churches. Ah, oh, Lord. I knew it was tough. Let's give you these three things and get you out of here. God demanded from them. There's three things that God, Micah lays out, my God, for Israel, what God demands from them. God requires three responses from Israel. Here they are. They were to do justly. To do justly. This speaks of their outward walk. Lifestyle still matters. Their outward walk. We have a saying that going home for Christ, lifestyle still matters. Contrary to what people say, man, how we live, how we conduct our affairs, that matters. Either you adding to God, Bible, or you taking away from God by how you live, by how you conduct your affairs. There are certain places, my God, that I tell my pastors that there are certain places and things that we don't get to do. We don't get to commit adultery on our wives and say we pastors. We don't get to look at pornography and say we pastors. Are you listening to me? See, I teach this type of stuff at my church. This ain't nothing new. We got to live something. The church ain't living nothing. That's why, my God, we are a mockery today. That's why people, my God, oh, my God, look at Christians today, my God, and laugh. That's sad. And it is. And if anybody in there tell the truth, they'd be like, anybody that's in, in, that's in reality will say, you know what, Pastor, my God, you know, we didn't think we was coming that way, but everything he said is the truth. Because it is. People are laughing at Christianity, Christianity and Christians today. Because our lifestyle don't match what we talk. If we worship God with our mouth, but our heart is far from God. And God is not pleased with that. So that's why he says, my God, for us to do justly. Our spiritual lifestyle matters. Oh, God, help me, Holy Ghost, Alvin. It's tight, but it's right up in here, man of God. My God, the, this refers to how they was to treat their fellow man as well. How, were they, how, they was to, how they was to treat their fellow man. It means more than just talking about doing the right thing. It means doing the right thing regardless of what everyone else says. If you're going to do justly, you got to do the right thing regardless of what other people are saying or what other people are not doing. We have to be willing to do the right thing. It means doing the right thing, as I stated, regardless of what everyone else is saying. And the second thing, my God, they were to love mercy. This speaks of their inward attitude. Inward attitude. Loving mercy refers to an inward commitment to God's truth. And manifestation, oh, and, and that manifests itself in a right relationship with God and with other people. Many people say, my God, people want to be right in right relationship vertical, but they can care less of being in right relationship horizontal. I like you, woman of God. Mother, I do. I like you because you understand truth. Many of us, many people, and I want to make sure that I preface this right because I want you to locate yourself. I didn't come to be your fan. I didn't come to be your friend. I come to preach the truth. And some of us is more concerned about being right vertical, but we can care less about being right horizontal. 
You know what that means? God know my heart. This between me and God. Well, if you love God, then you're going to love people because Christ came for the people. Don't tell me you love God, but then you dislike people. Don't tell me, my God, you want God to forgive you, but you won't forgive. See, we got to look at this. That, that goes back to that inward commitment. Are you listening to me? Mm, mm, mm. Lord, have mercy. Love mercy. We want to receive mercy, but we don't want to give mercy. We approach God every day and say, God, thank you for your mercy and grace. But then when it comes time for us to give somebody a pass, we call it pass. When it comes time to give somebody show some mercy, we want to withhold it. Y'all think God is pleased with that? You just asked me to give you mercy. You just asked me to show you mercy. Now somebody almost, you know, run you off the road and now you... Come on, somebody. Give them a pass and keep going. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yes, I had to make y'all laugh because y'all, y'all intently listen. Let's go. And the last thing, to walk humbly. So do justly was one, to love mercy. This is what Micah asked and Micah is in the scripture saying. Look, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Ah, they were to walk humbly with God. This speaks of the upward direction of their lives. This phrase speaks of a right attitude toward God that manifests itself in the determination Oh, my God, to walk in continued fellowship with him. I don't know about you, but I got saved April the 30th for 1995, and I've been totally dependent on God. I can't stay clean and sober. I've been sober now almost 30 years, clean and sober, and I can't stay. See, I know this. Let me help some of y'all. I can't stay clean and sober apart from God. I can't love my wife apart from God. Uh, you listen to me. There's certain things you're trying to overcome and do in your life, but you can't do it until you get in God. Are uh, you listening to me? And so, my God, one thing about it, because of the lifestyle that I come from, and I'm coming in for a landing, the lifestyle I come from, I knew that when God saved me in that prison cell at 115 in the morning, that I was going to have to be all in for God. Because I was all in for the devil. And many people ask me, how did you come up with the name going hard for Christ Church? Because it's so unconventional. I said, because I went hard for Satan. And now I'm going hard for God. Are you listening to me? And so, and so, and so, and so I've been able, I've been able to maintain because I've never let go of the horns of the altar. I never let go of God because I know I don't have a plan B. I don't have a plan C or D, E, F. It's all or nothing with me. Are you listening to me? Because, see, I know me. I'm not going to see myself because when I go hard, I go hard. When I was in the world, I went hard. See, I'm trying to say, so now I got to go harder for God. I wasn't no hypocrite when I did my, when I operated in my former life. When I robbed, stole, game bang, sold dope, robbed, all that. I didn't make no excuses. I'm not going to allow a holy God who's given me life and to get over in God and then start being a hypocrite, start being lukewarm. I was passionate about that former life. Now I'm even more passionate about God. And she'll try to say, I was serious about my former life that was killing me, and I'm most serious about God who's giving me life. So this is why you get these type of messages, because the church needs to understand serving God is a real serious issue. This ain't nothing to play with, church. And I hope I provoke some of you, my God, to increase your commitment. I hope the Spirit of God provoked you. I can't, but the Spirit of God provoked you, my God, to go a little harder for God, to be a little bit more serious to God, not to be ashamed of God. Come on, somebody, to love thy neighbor, to walk right, to live right, strive to talk right. Come on, somebody, that's what we should be. We should be affected. You come in here to get a word to go out there to make a difference. You come in here to get built up, get charged up, come on, to go out there to make a difference. God don't need you in here, he needs you out there. Yeah. Mm. My God, I love you. Let me finish. So he won't continue fellowship. Don't let your fellowship just, just be when you're at Harvest Church. Don't let it be just when you go through all the stuff throughout the week. At 1.15 in the morning, still have that fellowship. At 7 o'clock at night, still have that fellowship. When you leave to go out and eat lunch or dinner or whatever, you still have fellowship with God. Remember that somebody needs you. I was down here at the Thai place over here in Broken Arrow, my God, and uh, I was just me and my friend. It's got one of my sons in the ministry got through working out. We go out to the Thai place. Uh, tea, uh, whatever it's called, right over here. Anyway, we, I was just praying because I always pray before I eat my food. Yeah, I'm not ashamed. Ain't nobody where I go. I'm going to bless my food. I don't care where I'm at. I bow down and bless my food, my God. And I was just praying. The Spirit of God was just, you know, praying. And then, you know what I'm saying? I ate my food. 
Well, one guy came up that was eating, didn't know him, came over there and just thanked me for the prayer. You know what I mean? Because I prayed. When I prayed, I just, just said, God bless my food. I prayed. You know what I mean? And he came over and, and uh, said, you know, thank me for the prayer. And then I, I noticed I was getting ready to pay. He said, you know, he paid for me and my friend, my sons, all this food. I don't know what the Spirit of God said, but because I wasn't ashamed to pray, it, probably something the Spirit of God said through me is what he needed. See, some of you will get your food and sit down, but you won't bless God because you're worried about who's going to say something to you. Don't be afraid. To let your light shine. Don't be afraid to be a witness for God. What does the Lord require of you and I? To be a witness. To walk right. To do justice. To show love and mercy. Come on, to walk humble. Yes, Lord. I'm going to close now. Thank God I said enough. God has not changed his mind, church, about what he expects of the people, from the people. What God expects from you is that you be in faith, my God, in relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. When you, my God, when you and I, oh, my God, when you are, he expects you to demonstrate that relationship through the outward, outward, inward, and upward focus in life. When you are in relationship with Christ, he expects you to demonstrate that through your outward behavior, your inward commitment, and your upward focus. Bible, Paul says, set your mind on things above. Look up. He said, if I be lifted up, I would draw. God is telling us to watch our lifestyle, increase our commitment, and set our hope upward. Are you listening to me? <sighs> My God. Hmm. I want to ask you a question as I close. I'm done. When you think about some of the things that the Lord has said today. I want you to ask yourself. What do and what do I need to do to increase my commitment to God? Not works. Because sometimes we say increase my commitment to God. We think we got to do more. Go to more meetings. Go to more prayer meetings. Attend more stuff throughout the week. That's religious activity. So what does, some, you can come up. Somebody come up and play softly for me. So what does, or what is, what do, I'm sorry, or what is God asking and required of you today? What do you have to let go? The Bible says lay aside every weight and the sin that do so easily besets us. What, are, what have we missed the mark in? Mm -hmm. Am I struggling with being ashamed to be identified as a Christian? I don't know. I'm just trying to allow the Holy Ghost, my God, to kind of locate us, my God, because when you hear a word like this, you got to do something with a word. See, I'm trying to say, and one of the problems, my God, contextual to the scripture, my God, is that the people, my God, back then thought they was good. They didn't see no need to repent. They didn't see no need to come face to face with their issues, my God. My God, because they looked at other nations, they looked at other people and said, we good. But that's just what the devil wants the Christians to do today. Look at somebody else and, and develop that, that Adam syndrome, ease fault. Look at the blame, look at the deflect. My God, your story might not be somebody else's story. You might not have never been a drug addict. You might not have never dealt with porn. You might not have never been molested. You may have grew up, my God, in the palace and so forth, my God. But all of us, my God, is infected with the thing called S-I-N. All of us got stuff that we need God to do in our lives. And so the thought again is what does the Lord require of you? Of course, I gave you the three things, but you can take that deeper. What have I been holding on Though I profess to be a Christian, that I, that I came to the altar, my God, and I may bring everything else to the altar, but that one thing I have never brought to God. What's that one area in your life that you have never allowed God to touch? Come on, it's like a cavity. You know what I'm trying to say? If you touch it, it's going to hurt. What's that area in you, my God, that you don't want nobody to know about? What, what, what fig leaves are you uh, using to cover up, my God, inside of you, my God? And that thing that you won't let go, that thing you won't give God permission to heal, is the very thing that's keeping you from increasing your commitment to God internally. You got to come face to face, my God, with yourself. 
You can't help nobody until you allow God to help you first. The Bible says, my God, I tell, I had to tell a young pastor the other day, my God, the judgment ain't going to start outside the church. The Bible says judgment going to begin in the house of the Lord. God going to start with us. We so busy trying to send somebody else to hell, but we ain't thinking about all the hell we got in our heart. Oh, they don't say that over here? Well, I do. So don't be too comfortable because that's what the enemy wants you to do. Be comfortable. Think that you're okay. You may be okay in the natural, but are you okay vertical with God? Let him be the judge of that. If you don't know what your purpose is, my God, then you need to be asking God, what is my purpose? If you're walking around, my God, with stubbornness, pride, rebellion, or whatever, then you need to say, God, break that off of me. God loves us. We sung this song. But we got to be honest about our spiritual condition. And the church don't want to be honest. I'm not talking about all, but I'm talking about the church as a whole. We don't want to be honest about our spiritual condition. We're not hitting home runs like we once did. People are not in love with God like they used to be. People don't value relationships like they used to be. People ain't faithful in their private life like they used to be. There's so much going on. It's because, my God, we have too many things interfering with our commitment to God. So stand to your feet. As the man of God playing softly, my God, I don't never pump, prime, nor do I beg people to come to the altar. But this is what I do teach, and y'all know this over here because y'all talk well. In the Bible days, y'all know when they brought something to the altar, it meant sacrifice. It means death. You bring something down here to kill. You just don't come to pray. You come down here to kill. You come down here to sacrifice. You come down here to put something to death. So that's what I'm going to leave us with today. God has said a lot, and he said it fast and quick. But I want you to come with the mindset to kill whatever it is that you need to bring to the altar. So I'm going to open up the altar. If you feel like there's something, my God, that you need to bring to the altar, if God has spoken to you, or there's a condition, my God, that you want to bring to the Lord, come. The altar is open. Just come. If God has spoken to you, just come. If there's something you can relate to, just come. Ha, she get up, just come. Just come line up. Lord, have mercy. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and bring it up for me, man of God. Bring it up. My God, I'm waiting. This is so critical, so important. My God, thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for you to get your mind together, get your courage and your confidence together, because I know it's way more than this in here, the things that God has said. Mm -hmm. None of us is above this word, including the pastor that just preached it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Many things that we need to lay down. We need to increase our commitment and increase our hunger. Some of us, we don't read our Bible every day like we're supposed to. We need to be coming and asking God to give us an appetite for his word. Some of us, it's a shame to share the gospel. Mm. We struggle with the forgiveness, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the hate, whatever it may be. I'm not afraid to call it out, but you got to be willing to come face to face with it. Don't be deceived. Don't think you're in a place with God that you're really not. The Bible says, warning, come before destruction. Warning, come before destruction. This was a warning to all of us, my God, that we all got work to do. We, I didn't say y'all, we got work to do. Thank you, Holy Ghost. My God. My God. Hallelujah. My God, I'm waiting because they steady coming. My God, thank you for your honesty. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name, God. What does the Lord require of me? If you don't know your purpose, you should be coming. My God, mm, if you are discouraged today, uh, you're dealing with some form of depression or frustration or anger. If you're angry at God, you should be coming. My God, it's only we humans. We deal with stuff. We go through stuff. Just like y'all, I'm going through stuff. I'm going to pray just like I'm asking y'all to pray. I'm going to lay out. I do it every Sunday. I'm going to get on this altar and lay down because I got to talk to God. I need God to help me navigate through some things. I want to keep my vessel clean. So this just don't apply to y'all. It apply to me too, church. I can identify with y'all. Yes, we humans. We're going to go through things. We're going to deal with issues. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I love it. My God. Come on. Let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. My God. My God. My God. My God. Young men in the back, did you learn something today? Well, come on up here and get to God.
Did you learn some song? Come on. Come, come on. I got to teach y'all how to operate in the presence of the Lord. Y'all been back there talking, having fun. Y'all got to, come on. Talk to God individually. Talk to God individually. This is what I mean by provoking people to be healthy when it comes to God. Ask God to reveal your purpose to you. Ask God to reveal your purpose. God, what am I created to do? Why am I alive? Why come I didn't go through an abortion? Why did I make it out of my mama's womb? And find out why you created it. Because when you find out what you created to do and at your age, you won't waste time. You won't get caught up in a lot of stuff that you shouldn't be caught up in. So I want you to pray, young men, and ask God to reveal your purpose, why he created you, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Just a few more minutes. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you for everybody responding. Oh, God, we thank you. I'm going to get ready to lay down and pray. I'm going to turn it over to you for you to close out in prayer. But let them spend a little time in prayer right quick because they need it. So do I, okay?
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, Father God, as we bring this session, Father God, mm. to a close, I want to thank you, first of all, for giving us an audience with you, God. I want to thank you for the people of God, Lord, that was here at Harvest Church. As you just gave it to me in prayer, Lord, I'm asking that you increase their capacity, Father God, to continue to receive revelational truth, Father God. That you increase their capacity for the assignment that you have called them to in their lives, Father God. Everyone has an assignment, Father God, and you have to qualify, and, oh my God, and equip us to fulfill our assignment. So help, Father God, Harvest Church to fulfill the assignment for you, both in this ministry, corporately as well as individually, Lord. I thank you for every man, woman, and child that responded, Father God, to the voice of God. I pray, Father God, that each one of us, Father God, put to death, Father God, anything, Father God, that would interfere with our commitment, interfere with us acting justly, Father God, and walking humbly, Father God, and showing mercy, God. Lord, I thank you for the precious people of Harvest Church. Thank you, Father God. I love them, Father God. I honor them, Father God. And I decree and declare, Father God, health, for health individually, health in the body. I pray, Father God, that you touch their minds, Father God. I pray that you cover their children, that you watch over their grandchildren, and so forth, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you bless their businesses, Father God, oh God, thank you, that you bless their homes and bless their marriages, Father God, that you cover their children, Lord, that you protect them, Father God, from hurt, harm, and danger, Father God, we thank you for this spiritual cleansing, we thank you for this spiritual cleansing, we thank you for this spiritual healing that you have given us today, God. We thank you for challenging us to be better, to walk like you, talk like you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Father God, I release your glory and release your power and your presence upon us all. I pray that you protect them and watch over them this week, Father God. Let nothing come now unto them that would harm them. In the name of Jesus, Father God, thank you for these precious saints, these precious believers. Thank you for Pastor Richie, Father God, and Pastor Anita. Thank you, Father God, for allowing them to trust me with their people, Father God. And he know I love them, Father God. And I thank you for them, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Thank you for sweet, loving people, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Bless you. <laughs>